Westminster Shorter Catechism, questions 79 to 81. Question 79. Which is the Tenth Commandment? The Tenth Commandment is, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. What is required in the Tenth Commandment? The Tenth Commandment requireth full contentment with our own condition, with a right and charitable frame of spirit toward our neighbor and all that is his. Question 81. What is forbidden in the Tenth Commandment? The Tenth Commandment forbiddeth all discontentment with our own estate, envying or grieving at the good of our neighbor, and all inordinate motions and affections to anything that is his. And finally, here we come to the culmination of the law. It is the heart of the heart of the moral law. For in you shall not covet, we have no outward offense. Surely, outward offenses may come as a result of coveting, but not necessarily so. I would imagine many covet after something, but never actually take measures to get it. But this is the kind of law you can't really legislate, particularly in society. It's the kind of law you certainly could not enforce. You definitely could not prosecute it. That is because it is exclusively a law of the heart. It rules and it governs the inner disposition of the soul. It legislates the mind, the affections, and the will alone. It does not govern the outward actions of the body. And so first, the commandment requires contentment with what it is we have. If we're honest, we can never have enough to satisfy our covetous hearts. Our heart always wants more, or it wants something else. Even if we are content with how much money we make or with the house that we live in, there are always things that we wish we had or which we wish were different. Maybe it would be a, a better boss that we wished for, or maybe better employees. Maybe it's a different house, like one that has a pool or an updated kitchen. Perhaps we have a con content marriage, but perhaps we are always thinking of a spouse that would be better than the one we have. One that is perhaps more attractive or more patient or more attentive to our needs. And instead of being content with the spouse that God has given us, we begin to imagine and covet after another. This is the kind of envy which drove King David to steal another man's wife. Perhaps it's your neighbor's wife. She's younger. She's prettier. Or your neighbor's husband. He seems so attentive, caring, hardworking, kind-hearted. They say the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And our neighbor's house always looks a little bit bigger than ours, even if it's actually not. Certainly, there are times where at least some of our neighbor's houses look better than ours. Our neighbor's car begins to look shinier. Even our neighbor's pet begins to look better. That happens because our hearts are naturally envious because of sin, envious of what we don't have and discontent with what it is we do have. Second, we must not grieve the success of others. Think about how quickly envy arises within our hearts. 
especially when it comes to, to the success of others. When your coworker gets that promotion, or your neighbor gets that new car, or someone is honored and you're passed up for the recognition. Instantly welling up in our hearts is a certain resentment. Why can't that be me? Isn't it nice that they're getting a vacation and I'm stuck at home working or with the children? Galatians 5.26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Colossians 3, 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You see, rather than being resentful and envy the success of others, we should, without being fake, genuinely and truly rejoice and celebrate all the lawful good that comes our neighbor's way. Finally, a little bit more reflection on Colossians 3.5. Here Paul identifies the 10th commandment with the first and second commandments. Covetousness is idolatry. Think about why that is so. What is happening in our hearts when we are discontent with what it is we have or are envious of what others have. Two points to be made here. First, we are discontent in those circumstances with God's providence. His will is not for us in those moments most wise. We question His providence. Maybe we grumble at His providence. We regard our wills as wiser. Why can't my circumstance be different, better, other than what it is? And we begin to think that our will is not only wiser, but greater than God's. That, at the heart, turns us into another God. Second, when we envy what others have, we basically turn that thing that we are envying into a God to be worshiped. Just as setting our heart's affections upon another person in unbridled lust is adultery of the heart, likewise, when we set our heart's affections with unbridled lust upon the creature rather than the Creator, it is idolatry in the heart. Any and everything under heaven is a contender for being an idol. The evil one doesn't care if you worship an imagined red beast with horns and a pentagram or your neighbor's brand new car. It's all the same to him so long as you cease to lift your heart up sincerely and promptly to the Lord alone and instead lift up the affections of your heart to that which is created, whether an imagined devil or the possessions of your neighbor. In our next and final lesson, we will wrap up the meaning and the usefulness of the law. What hope is there for such miserable sinners as ourselves? Going to the heart of the law leaves us all utterly undone. And the choice is ours. Will we put ourselves back together again? Will we try to clean up our own sin and iniquity? Will we try to make ourselves more acceptable to God? Or will we look wholly, completely, and outside of ourselves to another?